Hey, I'm John Chen. I'm the CEO of uh, GeoTeaming. I'm also the author of Engaging Virtual Meetings. And this is a series around engaging virtual meetings that I get a chance to talk with uh, many people inside of the industry. Today, I'm very excited. I got my special guest, Drew Holmgreen, who's the Vice President of uh, Brand at MPI, is with us. Drew, how are you doing? Doing great, John. How about yourself? Fantastic. Now, let's see. I think you said you're calling in from your parents' house. Are you still in Texas right now? I am. I'm calling uh, calling in from Granbury, Texas. It's a little little uh, town just southwest of Fort Worth, uh, kind of in north central Texas. Yeah, I think I've actually been there once with one of my other MPI uh, Texas friends. So. There you go. Yeah, it's a, it's a great kind of, you know, little, little uh, uh, traditional Texas town with that traditional Texas square with the county courthouse, beautiful county courthouse in the middle. And oh, yeah. Uh, we can like this typically on Labor Day weekend, uh, it gets overwhelmed with tourists, just people getting out of the, the Metroplex and going to town. So we'll we'll see what it's like this weekend, but we're probably going to stick out here. My brother just my brother lives next door to my parents and he just put in a pool. So I think we'll probably just be hanging out by the pool with a lot of beers this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Private pool and beers. It's, it's a that's a yeah. high sign. That's that's the high life. And speaking of high life, yeah. right, I get to I get to say, I guess I should say hook them. Right. I love the, t the shirt you got going right. on today. <laughs> Sorry, I got to get it right. Holy cow. That's why I'm only a visitor to Texas. <laughs> um, meanwhile, um, why don't you talk a little bit? I, again, I've been an MPI member now for 14 years. I got my five and 10 year pin. Um, so tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do for MPI. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so I've been with MPI for about two and a half years now. Uh, before I got to MPI, I spent 17 years in the advertising agency business. Uh, I worked oh, wow. for Started off at McCann Erickson, which at the time was the largest agency in the world, um, and then you know made my way to uh, TM Advertising, uh, which was in Dallas and is now defunct, uh, and then worked for another agency called Proof Advertising, and then most recently, which was in Austin, most recently I worked for a small creative boutique called Belmont Ice House, and oh. um, all the way across that uh, that line there, I always had some connection to the hospitality industry. Um, mm -hmm. I worked on Texas tourism for about 12 years, um, so the major vast majority of my career. Worked on Austin CVB, uh, worked on uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Cooperative Organization, worked on the city of Addison, and then I worked on a number of hotel brands like La Quinta and Hilton and Radisson. So across my kind of agency life, I always had that. I always, man, I, my first account was Texas tourism, and I got bit with that travel and, and tourism and hospitality bug. And it's, it's been my passion ever since. So when I was looking to kind of transition away from the agency world and into uh, the, what, what, we, what we in the agency call the dark side, so that's going to the client side. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Darth Vader <laughs> here now. The stormtroopers coming behind me. Um, yeah, so uh, I was looking at the DMO space. I was looking at uh, the hospitality space. And a recruiter actually came to me uh, with the MPI gig. And I had actually bought advertising with MPI in the past. So I was real familiar with it because a number of my clients, specifically Austin, we'd done some pretty significant media buys with MPI because we knew the value of the, the membership. Yeah. So it seemed like a, a, a really good opportunity. Um, met with the crew there and uh, just really loved the leadership team immediately. When I met them, I had a good connection with Paul and with Darren and the rest of the team. And mm. uh, it seemed like a natural fit. And Two and a half years later, despite the past six months being a, a literally virtual hell, um, it's uh, it's it's a great gig. It's a really, I mean, you know, this having been involved for 14 years. The one of the things that I love about the hospitality industry, and I think the MPI membership is is a perfect example of it, is just everybody's so passionate, um, extremely positive, and helpful. Um, you don't you find competition, but it's it's friendly competition. Um, the passionate side is great. You know, being, being the brand guy, um, our members are extremely passionate about making sure this brand is given its best foot forward. So I get a lot of feedback from the membership about things that we're doing from a marketing perspective. And I appreciate that. I, I want to hear how we're doing. So it's, it's a, it's a really great association. It's a great group of people. I'm, I'm proud to be in the position that I am today. Yeah, thank you so much, especially in a position of leadership in this this industry. I want to go back to those those roots. You said you got bit by the bug. Do you remember what part it was, or like a moment, or or uh, you know yeah. what is it that that got you? So I was at um, one of the first things that I did when I came on board. Uh, I, I originally I started at McCann Erickson in Dallas, uh, and they tra they uh, transferred me to Austin to take over 
uh, open position there on the Texas tourism campaign. And, you know, I'm, I'm a 23 year old kid and, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know anything that's going on. You know, I'm just kind of learning about the seat of my pants. The first assignment that they gave me was to work on their digital campaign. Oh, now bear in mind, this is 2001. We had a $15 million budget. And of that $15 million, we spent $250,000 on digital, which if you change that to today, those numbers would pretty much be reversed. They're spending almost the majority, the vast majority of their media dollars on digital. Interesting. Well, then that agency experience really helps in that, that right. spending, right? Okay. Right. So yeah. when I started driving that campaign, I was coming up with new initiatives, working with the client, then started going on photo shoots and started meeting the community. It was one of those photo shoots where I realized I just love being able to market travel. To me, it's just it is, it's a, it's a passion that I think worldwide people get into that new experience of trying out a new place, finding something new. And there was some really good research a while back that came out that there was a transition of people um, purchasing products and showing those off to purchasing experiences and showing those off. Right. So it's the, I think the exact wording was people no longer care about what's hanging in their closets. They care about what they're posting on Insta, on, on social media, showing oh, yeah. off these little gems that they've discovered, and that's travel, right? So that's that bug. It bit me when I was on that the first shoot. The, the shoot was down in um, Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. Oh, uh, it's wow. just a beautiful, beautiful scene. And we had uh, uh, a uh, uh, a big bird. It was kind of a, it was a funny ad. So it was a big bird set up with uh, a big belt buckle on it. Um, it was a fake bird. It was a fake bird. Um, no birds were harmed in the filming. No, no way. birds were harmed. I was almost harmed. I pretty much sunk into that bog down there. But um, I mean, it was it was really cool. I just I loved being able to market the product, and you know, being a marketing guy, and now on the you know the the brand side for MPI, I get to market this product, which brings in so many different travel brands for the planning community to be exposed to. So it's it's a, it's just a merger of all great worlds, man. Well, I love that. You know, I've been uh, purveying around experience, the book that really guided me and my company over 23 years ago when I created it. It's a book, actually, it's down here. It's called The Experience Economy. Have you ever read it? No, I have not, but that sounds directly in line with what I was talking about. <laughs> and and the, one of the things that I still remember to this day from this book is a little bit the Starbucks model, which is like, you know, the beans itself raw, like cost less than, you know, half a cent, you know, as you go along. And then you build this curve about how much it takes to build that cup of coffee. You know, it's a... Uh, 50 cents if it's like this, it's a dollar if it's in a cup, and then basically it turns into four and 450 if you turn it into, you know, a mocha, right? right? With whipped cream on the top, the triple vente the way that you want it. And that was really kind of that value curve of experience um, yeah. that said, that's where that that's at. Speaking speaking of experience too, I do, I miss those things. I think, I'm trying to think like, uh, what I love about this industry too, is that when we talk about a place or location, a city or a venue, when you actually have been in there, you have a totally different uh, understanding of that place as opposed to if you just saw it or read it on, right. a, on a website. And so uh, now we're in this challenging part uh, about pivoting to virtual. First, I just love to talk uh, hear about how do we take that experience into virtual and what kind of what has MPI have uh, done to do that too? Yeah, so we we are doing our best to um, to make sure that we are keeping up with programming. So mm -hmm. I think the main thing that we focused on within our experiences, um, we have really changed our model of how we deliver education. So in in the past, in the past, and this just these, this just happened to intersect at the, you know, I'm not going to say the right time, but at the, um, just at the most opportune time, we were, we were moving away from in-person instruction courses and towards virtual, getting out of that space because we found that it was becoming more complicated for people to plan to go to education. Mm -hmm. So we were transitioning out of in-person education. And this, this started midway through 2019 and 2020 oh. was our launch for a complete virtual education series. So it wow. just kind of happened to fall in our laps that this was this was it was the right thing to do to begin with, but it just we happened to be just in front of that curve, right? Mm -hmm. So when the, when the pandemic hit, our academy team, um, led by uh, so our, our senior mm -hmm. vice president of experiences, Annette Gregg, she and Jesse States, who's our oh. director of the academy, yeah. love Jesse. Together, Jesse's fantastic. She's uh, she's been pinging me all afternoon. Um, <laughs> over text because we're trying to set up a meeting. Uh, she's trying to get a meeting at 6 a.m. in the morning next week. And I 
<laughs> that was my reaction. On Monday, no, yeah. Jesse, wait. <laughs> yeah, please, please, please. postpone. Um, uh, they came together and started mapping out this strategy of, you know, now that our, our, our member base and our community in general, outside yeah. of member, the entire universe is, has got free time, unfortunately. So let's give them the ability to better themselves in this time. So yes, they pulled together a strategy to create this entire series of education, but all focused directly on now. And they called it the coronavirus series. Mm. So it's education about safety and security. It's education about um, emergency preparedness. Uh, they just uh, last week, I believe, had a pandemic certification uh, partnership with ELI. And they had, I want to say, 120 people attend the course. Wow. So they've been developing all of this great, all these great resources. So that's one piece of it. Another piece of it, as soon as uh, the pandemic hit, we developed out an entire web experience and we called it the uh, trusted resources page and then a campaign behind it that was out in market to right. try and really just become a, an aggregate of all of this, this great data and great resources and, and not just focused on the states because we have to make sure that our entire universe of membership and planners and suppliers has access to um, reliable and relevant information to them. So we worked with our our membership, our leadership team in, uh, in Europe to try and bring resources there. So pulling all of those together, we essentially crafted an entire um, virtual platform for education, resources, and even connections all on the website so that you can't do it in person now. So now we've got that, that platform and that portal for everybody to get what they need. Yeah, that portal is so important. And the reason why is like, it finally feels like it's kind of almost slowing down, but it, it, and then some days it's not. The amount of change in information has, uh, you know, since March is rapid and it seems to change often. So as soon as you get one piece, you, especially in the meetings industry, you need to know another, if your location movements, you know, from one phase to another or any other things like that. So keeping up right now, I believe is one of the, the key resources. And again, MPI, one of the largest, you know, uh, meeting professional organizations inside the world. It's a really a valued service uh, for that. I, I really believe that education and networking continue to be association's top goals. And that education, I think is so valuable. I know a lot of people are taking advantage to that. I know that MPI has this huge library of, of education that even I haven't gotten to, uh, you know, in the past, but they continue to build that education um, and even today, I was on the strategy summit. I got a chance to present. Uh, so thanks to Laurie Pugh and the many others who helped create that. And they offered that free to non-members too. Right. And so, right. um, yeah, what do you think MPI's role is? I mean, you, 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 there's there's so much that you could do. What are some of the top uh, goals that MPI is trying to do to, to help our industry? Because they're definitely, I have a lot of personal friends that are having challenges right now because yeah. our business has been disrupted so much. Well, John, the main thing that we want to do is we want to make sure people maintain the, um, the their, their access to all the benefits. Uh, yep. We've been fortunate in that we got a significant infusion of funding from our foundation that allowed us to renew 1,200 members over the course of April through August who otherwise would not have been able to. That's uh, fantastic. So, so we got that. But then just recently, our partners, this just happened. We just put out a press release on Tuesday about this. IMAX donated $250,000 to MPI. <clears throat> so now wow. that $208,000 that the foundation provided, <clears throat> it just ran out. Again, things just seem to happen, <laughs> happen right. It literally ran out August 31st. September 1st, our IMAX donation went into play and that will get us through the end of the year. So we've got, we've been able to have this amazing access that when our members come to us and say, we just, we don't have money to afford renewing. It's okay. We got you. Fortunately, the foundation can take care of you. Now, fortunately, IMAX group can take care of you and we'll renew you and take care of it. Don't worry about it. Wow. So, and, 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 but you know, the, the main thing, John, is what I've seen in this. So I, I manage the marketing team and I manage the membership team. And going back to the, how amazing this community is, when we talk to members, we also talk to them about, you know, this funding is there for people who are really in a distressed financial situation, right? So if you're not and you can afford to pay it, please don't use it. And we've had multiple people say, you know what, actually I'm okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and pay full rate. 
don't, don't use that on me. And that to me, like that's so, that just, that describes this community, you know, it's, it's a community of people who want to help each other, who won't game the system. Um, so, you know, I, I love that about this community, but I also love that when this took place, the first thing that MPI did was mm -hmm. what can we do for them? Not, I mean, first and foremost, we do want to make sure that we have a sustainable future and NPI sure. is going to be around for the long term. But the immediate reaction was, okay, let's get our finances in order. Let's build out what we need to do to survive. And then let's find the best, most opportune way to keep our membership happy and to keep the outside community engaged and provided with resources. Yeah, I've been a member of this community now, again, those 14 years, and we've seen the dot bomb in 2001, the 2007, 2008, really affected the, the meetings industry. And um, again, I've been a big fan of IMEX. I've attended uh, a new, you know, Neville, uh, Miguel Reeves, who, who's oh, yeah. uh, been a, a part, past part of IMEX. And uh, yeah, being part of this community, it's the hospitality piece of this uh, part that that is the reach out and speaking of which uh thank you for our 20 people who are watching on facebook live hello lisa jen jen graves actually a vp a nurse here at one of our local hospitals nice. george sharp uh craig settles jeff hill uh jim fatore who's also uh, an MPI member, I believe, or, and I was also working with Linda Botts, who I know is a Linda, uh, who is an MPI member um, at the SeaTac uh, uh, Crown Plaza. You know, um, and so, yeah, our hospitality, our people, our industry. Um, you know, we've, we've I, I'm sure, Drew, you've attended now your fair share of MPIs and other people's virtual meetings. I would love to hear some of your best examples and maybe a little later on your worst examples, no names, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> so, no, no. Yeah, because I just this is something I'm really passionate around now too. I've been in this field, uh, and I did this digital piece. I really I used to do team building, all right, and uh, that's the basis of it. But we had this insight over 20 years ago that team building could be on online, and then people said, "Yeah, that's great, but we're still going to pay you for this face to face thing." And then, of course, in March, it, it completely changed. So a lot of the things that we knew about, we've been bringing forward. But I would love to hear what for you makes an engaging virtual meeting, and of course, what doesn't. Yeah, you know, the, the, the thing that makes it the most engaging is when it's live, okay? Um, right, right. I think that, uh, and, and that's, you know, without becoming an ad for WEC, uh, which is in Grapevine, November 3rd through 6th. Um, I just read, I literally took the time to read what you're doing because you have both sides. You have the hybrid yeah. side. So, so yeah, but go ahead. That's right. Um, we, we are taking a chance here. That entire event is going to be live, both in person and digital. There's not going to be mm -hmm. a single canned presentation. The best webinars that I've been on have been those that are live and the speaker is able to engage in some form or fashion with the audience. And a lot of times, because that's, that's really hard, right? Because you're up there speaking and when you've got comments coming through, you're trying to deliver some content, but you've got comments coming through. So the best way that I've seen it done is when you've got kind of a moderator who's there and able to cull together some of those comments coming through and those questions and then bring them to the speaker at some point, whether it's a break in between topics or kind of a breath that they're taking to kind of transition into something else or at the very end. Yep. When you have the ability to engage like that and um, the speaker is personable and the speaker is able to address those topics, that's when it works really, really well. Where it works poorly, and I won't name na any names, but I've, <laughs> I've sat on some webinars that have been completely canned all the way through. Um, right. And just, you, you can't, the, the only engagement you get is through a chat room um, and it's limited at best. Um, it, it, it just kind of, and when it's done, it's just kind of like, well, okay, well that, that was that there's, there's just, there's no, it's very anticlimactic. You know, uh, Drew, even even one of our larger organizations went and and they had something like that and and turned off the chat. And I was like, really? I was a little astounded. And I did. I, I had to go like I checked. Somebody said it was distracting, which I can not believe sometimes when the chat is going like if you're on the kids and you're on Twitch and you're watching the chat stream with 20,000 people, it's hard to read. But I still think it, you get something from it. I did a poll in one of my groups and 41 out of 41 professionals said turn chat on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so that's, it's, and that when you take that element out of it, you take the engagement out of it. And when we can't be face to face, right. Face to face is the, is engagement and we all need that. So if we can't have that and you, and the only way to do it in the virtual setting is chat, well, you're, you're removing one of the main elements of, of meeting. 
So that, you know, the, the best practice to me is to, is to, is to try and maintain those elements of face to face mm-hmm. as best you can within the virtual space. And that's keeping it live. Mm-hmm. That's making sure that there's engaging connection and that's having some type of interaction from speaker to, uh, to attendee. Um, and, and again, you know, I, I will say that what we are doing for WEC, um, the way that it has been planned, it's actually been planned as two different events. So there is, there's the in-person and then there's the digital side of it. Okay. Yeah. Talk about this. Cause I read about it. So I would love to hear it from, from your side. Cause I read it, but I would love to know what are you doing different in those two experiences? Cause you said it's going right. to be two different experiences. Yeah. yeah so and, and the, the easiest way to, to, to describe it is it's, it's the, it's Saturday night live. Okay. So the in-person attendees are essentially the live audience yeah. and those who are on the back end on the digital side are watching. Okay. Yeah. And the people who are watching, it's not just a stream. There's engagement that's coming through it. And Good. afterwards, the digital um, viewers actually get a green screen interview opportunity with all the keynotes. So whoa, there's, whoa, whoa, there's, whoa, whoa, whoa. You bring, you're bringing the audience in? Correct. So at the okay. very end of it, the speakers go off and then they get an opportunity to engage with the digital attendees. The, oh, inside, yeah. the in-person attendees don't get that. Um, instead of having a, so instead of just popping up a camera for the concurrent sessions, instead of just popping up a camera and having rows of people in a speaker for our concurrent sessions, uh, and it's, it's not going to be for all of them, but it will right. be for a number of them. Keynote, the main uh, stage, right? Yeah. Uh, so for concurrent, the digital audience will actually have that speaker doing their session to the digital audience at one point and then doing their session to the live, to the in-person audience at another point. Oh. So what happens if I if I'm one of the concurrent sessions, I'll deliver my in person to that group, mm-hmm. and then I'll probably take a break. In my case, I would grab a beer and then go to <laughs> our and then go to our green room, and you will do that session again for the digital audience. And in that setting, mm-hmm. like I talked about a second ago, you can engage with that digital audience just like you would with the in person audience. So Nobody you're, else doing this. You're you're um you're putting the speaker in a place where they can engage best once it live right no this is I think acknowledging right that the the face to face and the virtual experience is different enough that you right. need to be set up different right. right right and and I love this piece here this is actually one of the keys of the book so uh, we have a six step method called engage and one of them is called uh, N in engage is never lead a meeting alone yeah. right and that's this you have teams that are working on like things like wc which allow you to see chat and so that the speaker like this can stay engaged with this while other people watch chat and speaking of chat uh hello to michael um kiki uh the italian is on here she says i totally agree with you drew um and they have some questions that we're about to to hit with that so keep asking those questions uh and uh, becky finch is here so uh, I love what you're doing. Thank you for sharing that on WC. Yeah. And um, again, I'm going to give a nod to a lot of our pioneers. I actually got a chance to talk to Samuel J. Smith, who was also one of the early pioneers of like hybrid meetings. And I actually brought him into GMIC as a, uh, a remote person. He actually got involved in our team because he tweeted like he wanted to join a team. And we told him, come join our team. And we actually uh, <laughs> Skyped him into our team. So those are things that were happening like eight to 10 years ago. Uh, so I think you gave us some of the best examples or worth examples. I, I'll, I'll ask this question. There's so many questions on here, but um, other people ask. George Sharp, who is uh, uh, one of my good friends, also CEO for a training company, goes, what do you think a year from now looks like for the industry? And of course, w- my secondary question that is, what do you see as the future of meetings and virtual meetings? And I, I wrote an entire chapter in my book about this. So I'd love to share your views and I'll give a few of mine. Yeah. So uh, what, what's, if anything has happened here, that's been beneficial for our industry um, in the past six months, we have advanced uh, probably five to seven years worth of technology. We oh, let me, let me back you up on that. Did you see Twilio's research? No. You, you want to go get this. So Twilio is like a, a text, uh, you know, the text agency, they did research and they recently said they, they interviewed like fortune 100. And it says that this pandemic advanced it and communication technology, six years, they validated exactly what you just said. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. There's, there's another book. Um, I can't, uh, the future is, oh shoot. I can't remember of it. I can't remember the name of it. It's a book that I just bought and I'm about to read, but essentially what it talks about, and this came out pre pandemic, is that the technological advances that are converging right now will cause the years 23 to 28 to be the fastest moving advances in our in our species. 
um, because wow. we have all this convergence of AI and um, uh, data and just, it, I wish it's, something, it's not the future is now, but it's something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like a really cool book, but I think this may have even sped it up even, even more. Um, it, when you start to look to the, a year from now, five years from now, um, what I think what we are doing at WEC is uh, one of the stepping stones of where it's going to be. I, every event going forward is going to be hybrid, all of them. Um, it's right. Not, and I don't think that it's, I don't necessarily think it's, it's health concerns. I think it's, it's access, right? So mm -hmm. if you look at our, when we did GMID this past April, the past two years that we've done it, we had about a thousand attendees. This year we had 15,000 because people are so starved for information. And now they realize, you know what? I can do this in my underwear from home. Nobody's <laughs> going to know the difference. And the experience is different, you know? Just don't stand up, people. <laughs> right? I'm wearing sweat shorts right now. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing a Cardinal sin. I'm wearing a University of Texas shirt and Texas Rangers shorts, which I don't believe in wearing two sports teams at the same time. <laughs> 2020 uh, changed everything. That's right. That's right. Uh, breaking my own rules in 2020. Um, <laughs> I think, and, and I think it actually it, it expands beyond just events. I think you're going to start seeing... What the NBA is doing right now in the bubble is remarkable, yes. right? So I think if you've, if you've watched what the NBA is doing with their uh, uh, Michelob Ultra courtside, so they've got the, their virtual fans, right? 300 yeah. or so of them. I got a friend in the bubble, so I've been getting some intel. Yeah. Holy cow. So cool. Um, that type of engagement is going to become a staple for all sports. And I think you're going to start seeing it at events too, where you've got virtual attendees who are present. So they are visually there like they are in the NBA. So you've got, you know, you might have your, 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 you know, your stage set up and you may have seats over here that are virtual seats and it's people who are positioned and it may be cameras pointing up from their vantage point to watch. I heard, I thought in the early stages of the NBA too, they were trying to sell a product pre pandemic that was like, they had cameras on the players. Right. Like, like in the glasses yeah. or something like that. So yeah. you could actually see a first person LeBron James or whatever you want, you know, whoever player you're talking and about. I, and I think that that's, that's the evolution of sports engagement. That's the evolution yeah. of events engagement. It's going to become much more personalized, individualized with how you want to experience it, whether it's in person or digital, it's yep. going to be the vantage point that you want. One of the things that, you know, we work with budgets, so we couldn't make this happen, but one of the things we were exploring for WEC for the digital experience, if you've mm -hmm. ever watched the national championship uh, recently, past few years for uh, college football, even Super Bowl does it, but college football does it for sure. Uh, they'll have eight different channels set up with eight different broadcasts, right? Yep. You'll have your national broadcast. You'll yep. have your uh, University of Texas broadcast. You'll have your you know University of Georgia broadcast. Then you'll have your coaches broadcast. Then you'll yeah. have just the crowd noise brought and you can choose which one you want yeah. and that we looked at that to try and have different cameras set up and then the user could select which camera they want to watch from so, so I drew have you seen have you have you been to the the levi stadium no in san francisco no so so again i'm a seahawks fan you know i'm from seattle but uh, I got friends and my family is from the area and I actually got a chance to do some work at Levi Stadium. So check out, listen to this technology because I do believe a lot of this is this view into the future. One is that Levi Stadium is one of the, the few stadiums where the, the Wi-Fi does not collapse when you put 65,000 people in. <laughs> And the reason why is they had like, I think they're ex Google engineers and, and they stuck Wi-Fi points. If you look underneath the chairs before they installed the chairs, they had a Wi-Fi point every 15 to 20 feet. Wow. So they were pumping in some of the, the, the largest and fastest Wi-Fi so that you always had signal. And therefore the app on the phone, right? You could actually have those eight to 10 live cameras. They would do live replays of the wow. play you just saw and you could choose on your phone which one to see. Huh. And it was running all the time. And then just for you, Drew, you could order a beer and have it ordered to your seat. <laughs> Speaking my language. That's great. <laughs> Jews love languages, beer. Okay. It so, is. No, I, so some other things that I wrote on. So let me give you some of these other ideas and just see if you have any other commentary that comes up with it. 
I believe that, um, yes, this engagement and customization, getting back to this experience economy is back to that. How do you create an experience with this? And some of the things have to advance, like the technology has advanced a lot. And one of the things I tell people right now is watch all the platforms carefully. Like I'm uh, subscribed to Zoom's blog because they're now starting to accelerate. Now that they solve their security problems, they are starting to accelerate in features. And so are many of the other places like Microsoft Teams is what's powering those walls. They have 300 fans on the wall and they're in together mode which makes them look like they're in the crowd and for the players i think that that does add something plus their 300 channels of noise if they're yelling in their rooms actually comes into the stadium yeah. and so they are becoming part of that action i do believe augmented and virtual reality are things that are going to show up so they're going to get better the, the adoption rate is very small right now one half of one percent but if you could do something like put a set on and feel like you were in, right, uh, Moda Center in Portland, right, watching Damian Lillard. That's a shout out for my Portland friends. And okay. then, <laughs> or, or these other things, you know, I think that that's getting there. I, I know that I, I'd even wrote about, you know, if we actually had a room in our house that ended up being like a holodeck and <laughs> worked correctly, I mean, I think some of us who, who have access to the technology, we would do it because that's where the technology is going to go in the event that, you know, the rest of this world doesn't change. Uh, and I think when it does change, I have seen the studies that says some aspect is going to stay virtual because, Drew, a lot of us like, right, having this meeting and being able to go have dinner and a beer in our backyard with our family instead of being away from them so long. So Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. Again, it's it's customized to the experience. And, and I think a lot of a lot of people are realizing I just I don't necessarily need to be there. So now I can be more selective with with uh, with the, the meetings, events, shows that I want to go to. And I can and, and, and it may me I may actually spend more, you know, because I yeah. may find that <clears throat> there's you know, two dozen um, paid certification courses, webinars, events, conferences, concerts, sports games that I want to go to. But you know, I really only have the time to attend five of them. Yep. So I'll pay for the virtual pass for the rest of them. And then I'll pay to attend those five. Whereas in the past, I may have only paid to attend those five and I would have just ignored the rest of them. So it actually opens up a potentially larger revenue stream for our entire industry. Was the ASAE with something like a record 14,000 yeah. plus attendees? Yeah. yeah. Well, in Seabent's uh, event, uh, was it either this week? It may have been this week. Or next week, anyway. Um, they've got over thirty thousand people registered so far. Thirty thousand. Thirty thousand. Right? I think I found your book, right? It's either the future is now or the future is faster than you think. Future, future is faster than you think. That's it. there. It is the future is faster than you think. Which is uh, who's our author? Peter Diamandis uh, and Stephen Kotler. The future is faster than you think. Well, right. speak. Speaking of the future, uh, Drew, why don't you just leave us with this? What? And around the, the topic of engaging virtual meetings and as well as, you know, our, our physical meetings, uh, what's the last word you really want to give people that they can help them, you know, navigate the rest of this pandemic? Because we have no, you know, uh, speaking of the future, right, people have been asked about crystal balls. I, I, I feel fortunate because I took the long view months ago. Some people haven't. Some people right. have been waiting. Um, right. But I do believe that there's longer view and things will change. So uh, with your crystal ball, what what words or, or last words can you give uh, this group that can really guide them and help them uh, yeah, the, through this industry? The one word that I use constantly, and I use it a lot in our marketing is optimism, you know? So there's there's a big difference between, there's a, I'm, I'm sure you probably heard of them, but Simon, uh, there's a, a Simon Sinek put out this yeah. really cool, um, just a little diatribe about two, three months ago. And it was the difference between positivity and optimism. Okay. Positivity is, you know, I, I, I think I feel, you know, rah, rah, you know, that's, that's positive. I'm, I'm a cheerleader. Mm -hmm. Optimism is I know for certain that with this is going to work out. So as a leader, you know, being a rah, rah cheerleader, it gets people happy in the, in the immediate, but there's not a long-term thought. There's not a, there's not a, um, a, a true feeling, a, a belief, you know, mm -hmm. optimism is, I know that this is, that we're going to get past this. So whether it's, whether it's vaccine that, that comes through, they're saying prepare for it in November. So that's great. Um, or it's just continued improved processes. Um, we are going to get past this. Uh, we've done it before. 
um, 9-11 was awful. That was literally, I was at a conference. This was right when I took on the gig on Texas Tourism. Mm -hmm. I was at a conference in Austin at a hotel when that happened. I showed up again, I'm sorry for the beer reference. I showed up a little bit hungover to a meeting at seven in the morning. <laughs> And uh, I was meeting with, uh, with a Travelocity rep from San Francisco. And mm. uh, we sit down to have breakfast and she noticed that I was a little green in the gills. And uh, she, we, you know, we just kept seeing all this noise and stuff. And then you know, that, that unfolded. But what happened? Our industry recovered. It recovered fast. Yeah. Um, same thing after 2008, after the Great Recession, our industry recovered. It recovered fast. What we're really fortunate with and why there is so much hope and, and optimism in this um, the economy is, uh, is, is still bullish. I mean, the Dow went over 29,000. Again, that's the highest it's been since February. Um, yep. That didn't happen with the Great Recession. That didn't happen with 9-11. We didn't continue to have a, a fairly strong economy. So there's indicators there that show, look, it's not going to come back immediately. We, events as we know it are going to change forever, but they're going to change for the better because we have significantly improved our processes. We put into play things that we should have had a long time ago to be real frank. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're, we're becoming better prepared. Um, so optimism is, is what I always leave people with. Um, you know, I also always say hope is not a strategy. Sometimes it's the only thing you got, but when you have optimism, it outweighs hope. Hmm. I love that. Again, optimism over just positivity. You know, the one thing that I think that is so important in that optimism, people are looking for certainty right now because there is definitely so much uncertainty now. And I, uh, I, th I believe in that certainty that you have, which is I know the people in this industry. And even though they may be taking short term hits or, or there's ups and downs, there's other parts around that. What I do know, that especially meeting professionals, we're one of the most resilient people you ever met. You know, who else can handle like the last minute change? Oh, why don't we just move a thousand people to another room, right? So this is that group that can figure it out and figure it out on the fly, yeah. uh, kind of like uh, you know building that parachute around with yeah. that. I'm just the I'm just the marketing guy. I look at what you guys do, and I'm in awe. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah, I put up with a lot of hell in the marketing world, but yeah, being able to turn things on a dime like that, it's so impressive. Well, yeah. So, and so the, I believe in that certainty. Thank you so much for that, Drew. I, I'm glad that you do too, as part of that industry. Uh, we're going to leave you with that, right? If you want to be engaging, be uh, optimistic and bring certainty to your groups. And, and Drew, uh, I'm going to admit to, I'm a pretty good beer fan, especially here in Seattle. We got a lot of great beer. So if you, you just do this with the imaginary beer, all right, uh, I'm going to toast you. Cheers. Yeah, man. And I look forward to the moment you and I can have a real beer. You know, I think that's the one thing that's really, really missing yeah. in this uh, industry is that face-to-face -face time that's off the stage and off the record. That is some of the most valuable time in this uh, industry. And I look forward to when we can get back to that and do it safely. Absolutely. Me too, man. Excellent. We'll see you next time, Drew. Okay. Thanks a lot, John.